that at the moment. So that's partly what this uh, session is about. Uh, I am also the parliamentary candidate uh, for Labour in Gloucester, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> Uh, but just to assure you, and just to be clear today, or for the next hour and 15 minutes, I'm just uh, working in my positive money capacity, uh, which uh, we're a non-partisan organisation. So uh, thank you all for coming to this event on how will Labour pay for a, for a just green transition. Um, we've obviously many of you are here for a conference, and there was a big uh, Labour for a Green New Deal rally yesterday, and energy and enthusiasm is building that we can transition to uh, a green and sustainable economy that works for everyone, uh, which is great. And we need to think about how we shift our financial system to one that does that, because it's currently fueling climate change. Um, British banks like Barclays and HSBC are some of the worst offenders, lending over $85 billion and $57 billion, respectively, towards some of the most destructive fossil fuel industries. Uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, and we've also got a lot of fossil fuel companies dominating the FTSE 100, uh, and Shell and BP have the first and third highest value companies listed. So we're not going in the right direction on quite a few things when it comes to the city of London and climate change. Um, and we also obviously need to finance green industries, green technology. Um, and so how we're going to do that is what we're going to be talking about today. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers, just to run through who we have on the panel. Um, we have, uh, we'll start at the far end, we've got Bevis Watts. Uh, Positive Money is co-hosting this event with Triodos Bank, and we're really happy to be doing that for the first time this year. He is the Chief Executive Officer um, at Triodos Bank UK, and prior to this was the Managing Director at, at Triodos and previously head of business banking. Prior to that, he was the chief exec at Avon Wildlife Trust. We have Anneliese Dodds, who's the shadow treasury minister, who was elected as member for parliament for Oxford East in 2007. She's formerly MEP for the South East region. We have Chi Onwara, who's Labour's shadow minister for industrial strategy, science and innovation. Please come in, there's lots more room. Um, and was elected in 2010 as a member of parliament for Newcastle upon Tyne Central. Before entering parliament, she was head of com telecoms technology at Ofcom. We are waiting, but we'll be here <laughs> soon, is Anne Pettifor, the director of Prime, which is an economic think tank and research institute committed to, to highlighting glaring failure of mainstream economics and challenging the finance, financial sector's role specifically. She was forthcoming, um, she has a forthcoming book, The Case for the Green New Deal, and she was, has been one of the leading proponents uh, of the Green New Deal and was part of the, the kind of original Green New Deal group that got set up directly after the crash in 2008. And we're really pleased to be joined by Adrian Buller, who's the co-director of Labour for a Green New Deal, and she directs policy for the campaign. Uh, and sorry for those that were looking forward to seeing Grace speak. She's unfortunately not able to join the panel, Grace Blakely, um, but she's on lots of other events. I'm sure you can catch her through the festival elsewhere. Um, another good spokesperson on why we need to transform our financial system. Uh, so I think we're going to start with Annalise, if that's okay. I'm going to be a bit strict with speakers, so we've got around five minutes, if that's okay, and I'll give you a bit of a warning. Um. <laughs> Okay, thank you for dropping that bombshell on me just now. But uh, anyway, I want to be fast anyhow because I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other speakers. I think this is going to be a great discussion and certainly Positive Money's Fringe last year that I was on was one of the most interesting ones that I uh, was able to attend. So thank you very, very much for holding this. Um, now, I think we've got to start this discussion by saying that actually voluntary attempts to green banking and the finance industry have not worked. Um, that's not to belittle all of those who's been engaged with them. Um, but when I was writing this speech, I was thinking about the fact, this was before I knew that this gentleman was going to be sat next to me, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, there's only one Triodos Bank. Um, it's been growing, which is great. But as a proportion overall of retail banking, sadly, it's still not that, that huge. And if voluntary efforts have been enough, then we wouldn't be in a situation like we're in currently, where we still have a comparatively, albeit growing share for an ethical bank like Triodos, and we have Barclays, which, you know, as was just mentioned quite rightly by Fran, 
invested $85 billion into fossil fuel projects since 2015. And I'd like to really um, uh, pay tribute to all of those who've been involved in campaigning around that. Um, currently, only about 10% uh, uh, of UK banks are actually making long-term plans for managing climate risks, even although 70% of them have explicitly acknowledged that climate change is a financial risk. Um, so there's an awareness near, there, but there just isn't that action. Um, we've had the green finance strategy from the UK government, um, but actually a lot of that still is based around voluntary actions, um, which are just not going um, far enough. So we have commissioned a review into the finance sector. John McDonald's set that review up. Anne, who um, actually was talking at the previous event that I was at, so maybe she'll join us very soon. Anne Pettifor, she's one of the people who is sitting on that review um, and uh, both looking at how we can improve the situation to further catalyze much more public investment in environmentally friendly areas, but also how we can actually ensure divestment from brown um, uh, brown areas in the brown economy. Um, so that review is ongoing and it'd be really interesting to hear thoughts that people have about what kind of ideas we should be looking at as part of it. I think another key element of this, this discussion is also around shareholder and pensions activism as well. And Labour set out some plans around that, obviously at the last conference. We're working with the Trade Union Congress and others thinking, well, how can we really improve the situation where so often currently those of us who sat on pensions committees and who've been trustees are told by asset managers well actually we can't change anything because you're on this particular plan and if you shift away from it you won't be listening to my advice and that means that you won't be fulfilling your duties as a trustee um, we need to have a change there and we're focused on ensuring that we would have that change under a Labour government um, uh, I suppose just, just one kind of indication of how far we are away from any acknowledgement of the need to change from government, I think, came when we were actually discussing this matter in the House of Commons um, a few weeks ago when it was actually sitting. I think a number of us <laughs> would, would like to be sitting there for longer than we had been recently. Um, but Liz Truss, who's now the Secretary of State, of course, for Trade, back there she was in the Treasury, um, uh, and she said... Uh, when, I, when I asked her about having much tougher measures around the environment in relation to financial services and banking and investment, she said the fact is that we are going to make more progress not by supporting a bunch of anti-capitalists that glue themselves to public transport, but by <laughs> using market mechanisms instead, oh, yeah. helping the economy grow. That is the way we improve the environment. Um, and I think we, we really <laughs> see a contrast between that kind of um, almost aspirational approach in this area, um, which is getting us literally um, nowhere near where we need to be, and the absolutely determined attempt from Labour to ensure that we, yes, improve reporting mechanisms around much of this, but also that we do regulate where that's necessary um, and where we see the gap. I think another important element of this is ensuring that we create new institutions where they're needed. Um, so actually, if we look overall at where um, the banking sector has invested, um, particularly since the financial crisis, it's intensified since then. There's a real bias towards investment in real estate, um, much reduced, at least since the 1980s, focus on investment in technology, um, innovation and small businesses as an overall proportion of lending. Um, we think that has to change. We believe one way that we could do that is by requiring the Bank of England to be much more muscular in that regard when it interacts with the rest of the banking sector. But we also think that we need to crowd in some of that money as well. So we set out plans for a national investment bank um, uh, and series of regional development banks really drawing on the best of what's occurred in other countries around this. If you look at the operations of the KFW in Germany, for example, you can see how for many decades, actually, it's been investing in energy saving infrastructure, in decent quality housing, really in the, the gaps that we have in our current um, system for investment. Um, we think we need to have a more strategic approach to this. So um, we set out plans to um, create a sustainable investment board on which the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England would sit 
um, ensuring that the Bank of England is doing its bit to stop money flowing to environmentally destructive product, uh, projects and promoting productivity as well um, across the piece so that isn't as regionally unbalanced as we see currently. Um, and I think actually in this regard, there's, there's quite a bit that the, the bank itself has done to improve an awareness and acknowledgement of some of the finance risks in our economy. But unfortunately, many of the banks and other aspects of the financial sector just haven't been listening closely enough. That has got to change. Um, so it'd be really good to hear from what everybody else has got to say around this. I suppose I just wanted to end um, on the fact that, you know, very often when I talk to um, people um, involved in finance, not all, because there are a number of really impressive innovators in this space. People are really working hard to change things. Um, but when I talk to people, often they'll say, well, we really can't have any more regulation around any of these issues because now is the time when we've got to focus on growth. But we all know what choked off growth before. It was the global financial crisis that was created by a lack of regulation. And we also know what will be preventing growth and threatening all of our livelihoods in the future, and that is the climate crisis. So unless we grasp that nettle, um, I, and my, I'm very pleased that my, my uh, sustainable coffee cup has arrived just on time now that I'm finishing speaking. Unless we grasp that nettle, um, all of our futures will be in trouble. So thank you very much. Thank you, Annalise. Oh, Thanks, Annalise. We're going to pass on to Chima. Um, hi, great. Um, great to be here. I feel there are many people in the audience. So I, as, um, as Fran said, I'm the MP for Newcastle. Who, who's been to Newcastle here? Excellent. You know. um, so if you've been to Newcastle and had the privilege of walking through our fine Georgian streets, um, you will see if you, there that we are still living off the returns from investment in the first carbon-based industrial revolution, which Newcastle led. Uh, and you ask yourself, you know, why do we not see that kind of investment now in this industrial, this green industrial revolution? Because the returns from that could be as well, you know, could be even greater, not just a planet to continue to live on, not only a planet to continue to live on, but actually it's an economic opportunity of the sort of first order. Why are we not seeing that kind of investment? Why aren't we seeing that kind of investment in green technologies? You know, and part of the reason for that, you know, some of the things that Annalise talked about, and perhaps that also Anne will talk about, but it's, 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 one of, it's some of the things which drive our industrial strategy, and I'm speaking as the Shadow Minister for Industrial Strategy. And that's, um, you know, it's part, it's based partially on the work of the economist, another great woman economist, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who points out that um, you know, f one of the challenges we face as progressives is that finance has stopped financing the real economy. Finance is financing finance. Now, it's not only the, the real estate, what Annalise talked about, but there is much more money to be gained much more easily in financing, you know, pay derivatives and collateral um, 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 financial instruments rather than the risks that come to investing money in a wind farm or in a manufacturing plant to manufacture new ba battery technologies. And so Labour, you know, a Labour government would change that, would change that around and we would invest in all the green technologies and car decarbonisation, which can deliver not only a, a, you know, a net zero economy and at the same time, fantastic jobs for people. Because I want to, I mean, the key thing for me here is that, you know, climate change is an existential threat to all of us, you know, to all of us, wherever we sit in the sort of the economic chain. You know, but if we don't have a just transition, you know, if we don't have climate justice, then we will find ourselves in a situation where those who lose out will be voting. And I would say to you that part of the Brexit vote was already a, um, a vote on the, the deindustrialization, the way in which deindustrialization has happened. So we have to make, it's absolutely a critical part of, of addressing 
you know, climate justice cannot be something that's done to working people. Working people have to be part of moving to this new, a sustainable economy. And that's where, that, and that is where our, um, our policies are focused. So we, our, our policies are mission-based because we want to address the great challenges of our uh, age. And our first mission is to decarbonize our economy you know, by, uh, and, and to create a net zero economy. Now the dates for that are currently at 2050 for a net zero economy, 2030 for decarbonizing our energy production. But we think that as part of the climate em emergency, that has to be accelerated. But so to achieve that, we're going to invest 2.25 billion in green technologies like carbon capture and storage, affordable electric vehicles, such as the announcement that John McDonnell made uh, yesterday, low carbon chemical processing, investing in green technologies and creating green jobs. Uh, and we also need to mobilize uh, public and private investment. So Annalise talked about our 250 billion pound national transformation fund. But w as part of our second mission to create an innovation nation, we will be raising the proportion of our uh, GDP that goes on R&D to 3%, so from the current 1.8%, which is like way behind most of the OECD. And what that will do is be, will, will create, um, a not only create greater skills for uh, the green economy, but it will, it will help bring in and attract private companies to move away from investing in carbon-based uh, technologies and move into green technologies. And we will, you know, we'll, we will, we'll, through the public ownership of major infrastructures like railway and through providing public and private sectors uh, support for commitment to decarbonization through construction, so to, we will uh, support modern methods of uh, building into construction to decarbonize the construction sector. You know, every sector will be supported into moving into a, um, a, uh, a sustainable um, economic uh, environment. Just to, to, to finish with, you know, as I said, as I started, this is the fourth industrial revolution. When we had the first industrial revolution, we didn't have democracy. We didn't have unions, we didn't have a labor movement. And those who, those who suffered from the first industrial revolution were mainly significantly working people whilst the profits went to the, um, the, 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 uh, the richer. What we will do as a labor movement is to harness technology advances to protect our planet and also make a fairer society. So to bring about global justice, uh, climate justice on a global scale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Chi. And just to say, there's a few of you standing at the back. I can see about five spare seats from where I am now. So if you would like to come and sit down if you're sat on the floor, you don't have to, but there are seats. So maybe you could wave if there's a seat next to you, be friendly. Um, I've, I've introduced you already, Anne. Um, thank you for joining us. She's the, one of the leading proponents of the original Green New Deal and bringing it back now with her forthcoming book. So really excited to hear from you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I have to stand to speak and wave my arms around. So first of all, can I say that how are we going to finance the Green New Deal? The first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to transform the international financial system, the globalized financial system, right? You may think that's hard, but it's absolutely essential if we want to do something with our domestic economy, if we want to invest on the scale that Annalise is talking about. Now, you may think it's crazy and impossible, but let me tell you that I, have been, I am quite confident that quite soon our economy is going to face three shuddering shocks, right? The first is, is going to be the possibility of a massive climate crisis. A big city on the edge of the sea somewhere, someone that's very close, that a city that's exposed to the rising waters caused by the melting of the Arctic could go underwater. Now, I'm not sure, it won't be New York. New York's had a, its sandy crisis and, and when an awful lot of New York was flooded and went underwater and for a very long time. 
but it's more likely to be in a poor country, but it'll be a big city and it'll be catastrophic. And that's what will wake up the world's leaders to the real crisis that we face. So that could happen. Secondly, it's not impossible that we wouldn't have a war. We know from history that trade wars lead to real wars. Now, you know, I don't want to be too cheerful here this afternoon, but, <laughs> but, but let me just say that I think trade wars, the trade wars that have been fought at the moment are getting pretty ugly, right? And we're now dominated by authoritarian leaders in the United States, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, Putin in Russia, Orban in Hungary, in Europe, fascism is coming, right? And that is a threat to the system. But the final thing is we could have another global financial crisis. Now, last week, there was a flutter in the duck pits in New York when the big investors couldn't get their hands on enough cash in the repo markets. Don't worry what they are. They just couldn't get enough cash. They were having to flog their assets and they couldn't get enough cash for it. So the Federal Reserve had to pump out $75 billion to help out these guys, right? Unexpectedly. Now, that itself is not the crisis. What it's an indication of is the volatility in the system. It's going up and up. And even more terrifying, Gillian Tett had an interesting article in the Financial Times about this. She wrote that neither the Federal Reserve, with all the clever people who have worked there, nor the investors themselves understand the cogs that are making the financial machine go round. They don't understand. What, that nobody really understands what happened last week to cause interest rates to rise and to force the Fed to churn out $75 billion. So the possibility of another big financial crisis is not remote, right? And in those circumstances, the left must finally be ready to, and prepared for what has to happen next. 2007 9, the whole global financial system falls down, and we stand there with our mouths, our mouths open, saying, Oh, what just happened, right? And we didn't have very much to say to the delight of the financiers, right? In, because what has happened since the crisis is they've got bigger than they were before, you know? Furthermore, they're backed by governments. So they are too big to fail, and their bosses are too big to jail, right? So they can't believe their luck. Why? Because we didn't have anything to say about what the alternative was or what we wanted to see happen. So I just think that's terribly important. Now, the thing is that a Labour government has to do three things. It has to mobilise the finance, which is going to be hard without control of the financial system. And, 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 and a Green New Deal has to be based, in my view, on three principles. Three principles that we should be advocating and be proud of. First of all, that society will prioritise human needs and not human wants. Right? We will make sure that people get roofs over their head, that they get food, that they get supported, that they get sustained in their lives, and they get health and they get education. All of the things that we need, which are real human needs, our wants to go shopping every day and to go onto eBay or wherever and or Amazon and just you know the flick of a switch consume more to have different fashion outfits that we wear once, not even for a season, but for one day and then then throw away. That's going to end. Our wants are going to have to be limited, and we're going to focus on. Secondly, a Green New Deal economy is going to be a labour-intensive economy. We're going to have to substitute labour for carbon. We're going to have to grow our own green beans. We won't be able to fly them over from Kenya, to put it crudely. We're going to have to move ourselves around. We're not going to be able to rely on petrol in cars to move us around. We're going to have to learn to cycle, to walk, but also to have public transport, which moves a great number of us at the same time. And a Green New Deal economy is going to be localised, not globalised. We're going to be concentrating on serving the interests of the community here at home, not on serving the interests of the international financial system out there in the stratosphere. That's the essence of a Green New Deal. But first of all, we have to transform the financial system. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anne. Um, and now we're going to hear about how a sustainable bank works and operates from Bevis. The start of that. Well, not too much of the bank. I'll stand up to, uh, so the people at the back can see as well. Um, so hello, everybody. I, my name is Bevis, and I, I run a bank. Um, the bank is called Triodos Bank. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, I'll let you... Google it, but to suffice to say, um, Triodos have been pioneers uh, in sustainable finance for nearly 40 years, uh, only financing things that demonstrate positive environmental social benefit. And it's important I give you just a sense of size. So we operate in six European countries and have a global footprint through an investment banking arm, um, but we're primarily a retail bank that has a balance sheet of 17 billion euros and about 700,000 customers. That makes us the smaller end of medium-sized banking. And it's quite important for what I want to tell you about why I really see the importance of retail banks changing. Uh, in a moment, you'll get an idea of that context and, and scale. So I, 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 for 24 years, worked for a range of different environmental organisations, and I've been passionate about the role of money and the power it has to change society. <laughs> and I'd really love to see change in retail banks because they are the ones that are most closely connected to the retail economy and the ones that have the greatest potential to have widespread disparate impact on the many challenges we face, particularly around uh, decarbonisation and climate. Um, so coming back to um, sort of the scale of the challenge, um, every year there is a, a global league table published called the Clean Energy Pipeline, and that looks at the performance of banks in financing renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. So in the last four years where we've provided our data to that pipeline, we have topped the table in terms of the number of renewable energy deals financed worldwide. So no other bank in the world finances more transactions. It was 78 transactions in 2018, totaling $800 million. Now, if you're a big bank, you can question that and say, well, you know, um, that's by number of transactions. You help a lot of cooperatives and community-owned renewable energy organisations. Where the real scale impact will come from is from volume. True. So in the volume terms, we still make the top 20 banks worldwide, despite being a small, medium-sized bank. So we're in at 19. And there's only one UK bank in the top 20 that's just ahead of us, and that's NatWest that financed 832 million US dollars worth uh, of transactions, only six transactions in 2018. So that gives you a, a, a real sort of sense of the scale of the challenge. I find that quite depressing that we've only got one UK bank in the top 20 uh, worldwide that's um, really engaged with that challenge. So we're talking billions invested in fossil fuels, 150 billion since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed, by the top four banks in this country versus hundreds of millions going into um, renewable energy. So that's the uh, sort of scale of the challenge we have. We also have to remember it's not just about carbon and climate change, fossil fuels, it's much broader. So three just um, thoughts to leave with you uh, as to things that might want to be relevant to uh, a Green New Deal. Um, the first is today in New York, the UN principles for responsible banking uh, are launched uh, formally. They're formally adopted by the UN and there's 130 banks signing up to those. We were one of the founder banks uh, when they were launched for consultation, and colleagues of mine have been um, key authors of, of those principles. Um, I understand three of the big four banks in this country are going to sign up to them. One of the things they will require is transparency. So for decades, we've published a list of all of the loans that we make uh, worldwide, and I think one of the things we have is great inertia. People do not know what their money does. Uh, and we could really wake things up uh, and create much greater competition if people really understood how their savings and their current accounts uh, were being used. Um, so that's the UN principles, and I'd love Parliament, and there's an all-party parliamentary group on uh, fair business banking who I'd love to hold um, uh, banks to account on how they adopt those principles. Um, secondly, tomorrow in uh, New York, um, something called the Platform for Carbon Accounting Financials will be unveiled. This has been uh, something fostered by a group of financial organisations, including ourselves, and in May we became the first bank in the world to publish the carbon footprint of our loan book. This is much more holistic than just fossil fuels. This is about the carbon footprint of your housing portfolio, of your agricultural portfolio, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we need, and again, we need Parliament and we need um, banks held to account on what they're doing in that regard. And the very last point, because um, I'm out of time, is uh, I would also like to see um, the, the role of central banks rethought. If you believe in a sort of donor economics type uh, concept, then we need to change the role of central banks. And it's great, the Bank of England have been front runners and uh, really led the way in recognising the climate risks that banks are exposed to, but we are still sort of ans answering um, last year's exam question in that 
we need to have banks that recognise um, they are creating these societal systemic risks. Uh, and we need to have mechanisms, which I'll happily talk about in the Q&A, that, um, that the Bank of England can implement to address that. So more ideas later. Thank you, Travis. That was fantastic. And we're going to um, finish with Adrian from the Green New Deal. Hi. Um, so one of the things that um, we try to do with Labour for a Green New Deal is to sort of reframe uh, the debate of what we think is possible when it comes to ambition for tackling climate change. So I guess I will try and keep my remarks short and sweet and along that theme of sort of reframing how we think about paying for, you know, avoiding climate breakdown. So the first was sort of to draw on what was just said, which is that um, when Mark Carney announced, you know, in the spring of this year that the Bank of England would be doing a review of uh, the climate risks that they have, um, it, again, failed to recognize, as you said, uh, their role in directly creating that risk. Um, so, you know, after the financial crisis, the central bank, uh, the Bank of England, engaged in a massive quantitative easing scheme, um, which, as we know, in addition to sort of increasing inequality, um, went disproportionately to uh, corporate bonds that are engaged in fossil fuel intensive and very carbon intensive parts of the economy. So they are directly a player in, in driving the sort of systemic risk that they then pertain to, uh, to have to minimize. Um, and another kind of framing that I think we need to get over um, is the idea of um, reasonable costs. So um, when the CCC published their report um, on net zero 2050, um, they said that the cost of achieving this would be one to two percent of GDP. Um, and they also said uh, that this was the same cost that was predicted for achieving an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, the preceding target. Um, now, rather than say, you know, this is phenomenal and recognizing that this means that what we expect the costs to be are constantly falling, and therefore we should raise the ambition of our plans for decarbonization, uh, they said, great, uh, this falls within the same envelope of costs, and that is therefore reasonable. Uh, and they described it as cost effective. Um, now, to me, that is just the opposite of the mindset that we should be taking. Um, and so the focus should be, rather than on you know, the minute costing of what we're trying to do, um, moving out of that space because what we're costing ultimately is, is the world. Thank you for that. Um, this is a big topic. How do we change the finance system so that actually doesn't fuel climate change but actually tackles it? And we've had some really good insights from all of our speakers. We want to get you all involved, but there's a lot of you. <laughs> so before I open up the floor, we'd really love you just to turn to either someone you came with or someone you don't know, and we're just going to give you like two to three minutes, so not very long, but just to kind of reflect on what you've heard and anything you want to bring into the mix in terms of how we should think about funding a green transition. You've got two minutes. Um, okay, we're going to wrap up there because we want to hear from you and we don't have that much time. Um, but maybe if people have concise comments or questions, it would be great to see a couple of hands in the air, um, looking for some other... Okay, we're, this, is this one on as well? <laughs> so we'll go to... The first hand was with grey T-shirt, uh, then the flowery shirt, and then looking for a woman... Is there any female that wants to say anything? Um, Somebody at the back. Oh, yeah. And then at the back. Uh, so we're going to go great. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take all of them at the same time. So if you can keep them nice and concise. Okay. Thank you. My name is Steve from Southampton. Um, a councillor in Southampton, cabinet member for Green City. We okay. formed a Green City portfolio a year ago. Um, so what you were talking about, um, I really appreciate that. Uh, it's quite a macro level. Um, so as a, as a council, we have to do things every day. So we've introduced lots of measures. So there's lots of things that we can do from the bottom up. For example, we launched our own energy company last year, um, not for profit, 100% um, green renewable. In the last 12 months, it's equivalent to 1,600 tonnes of carbon coming out of the atmosphere, and we've done that ourselves. 
One last point. Um, invest to save, I think that's really important. So we're about to commence a three-year program to switch all the lamps in Southampton to LED, which reduces the consumption by 85%. It costs three million pounds. Um, it takes three years and it's a 5.6 year payback. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Brian Gamage from Chesham and Amersham, CLP. Um, I actually have a question for the panel about the flow of finance to make sure that finance goes towards the things we need to make sure happen. And it's really about how do we break the status quo of the existing banking system. So the question is quite simply, do you agree that a combination of microfinance and fintech is probably the way to set up a system with the right regulatory framework that could re reset the banking system in favour of the things we need to do? Great, and at the back with the glasses, there was a hand. Thank you, Charlotte Morgan. I'm the chair of the Carbon Capture and Storage Task Force and produced a report last year. So delighted to hear um, that you're committed to, to carbon capture and storage. Um, and just really a question as to um, how many clusters you would see financing in going forward. I know that the, um, that the CCC have suggested that five clusters for storage should go ahead um, and that the base Select committee suggested three, and I just wondered what the Labour Party policy was on that. Great, thank you. But three pretty specific questions around council, microfinance, fintech, and CCS task force. So we'll start with Annalise, and then Chi, and then um, maybe Bevett. Sure, brilliant. I mean, first of all, it's really terrific to hear. Whoops, sorry. It's terrific to hear about what what you're doing in Southampton. I'd, I'd already followed some of the developments closely. It's really fantastic. But we do need to get to a situation where it's easier for local authorities and indeed central government as well to have longer term perspectives for investments and not to have that bundled up with consumption spending as so often it has been in the past. Um, we're getting to a slightly better position on housing, for example, but we're still very far away from where we should be. And actually it's very difficult for local authorities a lot of the time to borrow. I mean, there are some alternative kind of models for, for financing that are around. Um, but one thing that we've been working on as a shadow treasury team is saying, well, how can we open up that long-term perspective? Because you're absolutely right in this area. If we invest, we will save. Um, and yet we've got a situation where, for example, we know this is about the planning system as well, but when it comes to new housing developments, for example, a local authority can be really ambitious and determined about putting in lots of energy efficient measures and um, renewables, etc., on that housing. But if the developer just turns around and says, well, actually, you can't have as many social homes as a result of this, um, and you can't get the investment from anywhere else to put it in, then you're completely scuppered. So we, we've got to change that. Um, around microfinance and fintech, I'm sure that is part of what we need to talk about. And it's certainly the case, you know, if you look at, again, that balance of lending, and indeed this was talked about before, that you know, we, we really have seen a shift away from the kind of relational banking as well that, that would have existed in the past that could have helped to catalyze some of the smaller scale developments that we need. Um, but I think we also do need to have additional large scale finance being put in for some of the, the larger projects that need to occur. And again, I think that goes back to the, the previous question. We need to have that longer term perspective on that investment. It's not sensible bundling in spending on these measures which will reduce costs and deal with the climate crisis in the future with current consumption spending. It just really doesn't make sense. And I think I'm going to leave the carbon capture and storage <laughs> question to Chi. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that. And um, so, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I don't think my understanding is that we haven't con we haven't set out how many carbon capture, capture and, and storage clusters that are optimal. Um, but I will get if you set, uh, if you get give me your details or send me your details, I will get back to you on that specifically. Um, um, and if you have if you have concerns or if you have particular insight that you want us to share, then we'd be very happy to hear from that. My colleague Alan Whitehead is the shadow minister uh, for energy. Uh, but I would uh, all, I would say that the, that the importance you know of f of investing in you know in, in carbon capture and storage and other uh, technologies which can effectively transform our sort of carbon based energy uh, production are is something that we absolutely recognise and we've committed the funds to 
and it's something, but it's really, you know, sad that the Conservative government for so many years has just refused to invest in them, and so that effectively we are we are behind. Um, I wanted to say on the cities thing that the Southampton, that, that's absolutely, I think, you know, one of the, I didn't talk as much as I should probably would have liked to have done about regionalism and uh, climate change, because I think that cities are somewhere particularly where some of the ways that we address climate ca change can be tested given the right investment and in regulatory conditions. And so, for example, you know, also modal shifts in terms of um, you know, transport. And again, just the, you know, the fact that in Newcastle it costs more to go four steps, four stops on a bus than it does in London to go across the entire city. You know, that is something which is a, a barrier to effective, um, you know, effective change <coughs> in regions and cities particularly need to have both the uh, funds as well as the powers to change that. So, you know, devolving austerity does not help significantly in addressing climate change. Devolving both the funds and the powers to really make a difference we should help. And finally, on because I'm the vice chair of the um, All Party Parliamentary Group for FinTech. And, you know, I think I, FinTech, I, I was glad that you added the thing about regulation. I think, I think FinTech, is, you know, can be, can be transformative and microfinance can be transformative, but I think the way it is driven now, you know, it's it's driven by the big banks, really, you know, they make put, putting most of the, they've all got fintech um, subsidiaries or fintech projects or startups, and it is not, it is not, for me, fintech should be delivering on greater financial inclusion and greater investment for um, small businesses, for startups, and for a new sustainable economy. But I don't see that happening significantly yet. And I think that a government which knew a bit more about uh, technology as well as v wanting social progress could achieve that. Great, and I think Bevis wanted to comment on that one as well. And I just saw someone mouth, well, what is FinTech? So uh, can you explain <laughs> that too? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I can. I suppose uh, in, uh, in the... <laughs> On, on your first question, is microfinance part of the solution? Is uh, the getting more money into um, economically challenged areas is definitely part of the solution? And ourselves and Big Society Capital yeah, recently yeah. announced a 40 million joint sort of investment yeah, to better um, capitalise the CDFIs, the Community Development um, Finance um, Initiative. So that's definitely part of getting to um, where money hasn't been getting. Um, uh, are fintechs the, the solution? Um, no, and I'll, I'll explain why. Partly because the fintech is a term that captures e everything. It can mean sort of new digital app-based bank. It can mean something that I might work with or buy or partner with as a bank that changes my customer experience and screens them for money laundering purposes. So the, the fintech arena is huge. And you saw a first generation of people claiming they would be disruptors and challenge the main banks. And now you see banks buying those fintechs and plugging them into their infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, uh, firstly, I think you've got to nail what you mean down by uh, fintech. And I think it can play a role, I agree with Chi, in dealing with accessibility and inclusion uh, uh, and so on. But it won't deal with everything. It's not going to deal with the fact that branches have disappeared and that there's a sort of new form of financial inclusion through that that uh, we need to address. But um, ultimately, we need to change banks. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Definitely. Uh, and just a shout out for an organisation that we work with a lot called the Finance Innovation Lab, and they really focus on how a lot of fintech has no social purpose, but it could do if it had a social environmental purpose. So we're going to go back to the audience. I've whilst you're putting your hands up, I'm going to bring in one question, uh, which might be directed to this side of the panel from some of our supporters. So we're, we like to think of ourselves as a people powered organisation, and we got some su positive money supporters to submit questions. Lynn from Hexham says, uh, we all know uh, now that we have a climate emergency, but we keep pushing for economic growth. How will we actually adjust the way we behave, the way we go around every day in time to halt the burning? How would we sell uh, a new measure of success that is in GDP um, to the nation, but also, you know, people, we all have pensions, we expect our pensions to grow. I think that's a great question. I'd like to take two more before I come back to the panel. There's a there's a hand here, and then we'll take that one. Just 
just right here at the front. Hello, yep. Um, it seems to me stark. <laughs> yep, <laughs> they agree. <laughs> and the room as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely stark. But currently, the Committee for Climate Change is not fit for purpose. Uh, Labour will replace it, yes? <laughs> and then in the Thank second you. row? Chris from Hammersmith. Uh, I, I'd like to ask the Tridash uh, manager here um, about uh, setting up an account because it seems um, I've known for a long time that what a good bank you are and it's a question I have money in two separate small accounts. I mean, is it worth me just putting a small amount and setting up a Tridash account and then moving stuff across or is there an easier way to make the transition? Could I literally, is there a way of, trying of getting a bank account moved uh, over to Tridash? Thanks. Great, we've had two very specific questions. I'm going to take one more. There's somebody sitting on the floor down there um, and we'll have four questions in this round. All comments. Oh, okay, first of all, pardon my English because I'm, I'm French, but I'll try something. Uh, I, I'm maybe you, you uh, spoke about that before because um, I, I realized late. But my question is about free exchange and agribusiness. And uh, could you um, uh, point uh, how to manage the free exchange, uh, the free exchange type of relationship we've got wi with the US or with South, uh, la Latin South um, America, um, for because <coughs> this is a big part of the global warming of uh, the transition we, we have to do, is um, change the way we eat, change the way we do that, and uh, it's all uh, connected with the free exchange type of um, uh, yeah. trade. Free yes, trade. thank you. Um, and uh, how do you manage to fight this uh, free exchange kind of trade in order to finance uh, um, more reason, reason, reasonable, uh, um, sustainable, so <laughs> 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 sustainable um, uh, agroeconomic. Um, way of thinking. Mm, sorry, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Can we start with Anne with the growth question and maybe a bit on free trade if you want to chip in? Sure. Um, I mean, the growth, the term growth, economists use it instead of talking about the economy expanding, right? The problem with the term <coughs> is that it has inherent in it, it's very interesting, it has inherent in it the idea of limitless, of exponential growth, and that's what it's meant to have, right? Economists don't talk about death, they don't talk about aging and death, you know, we, if anything grows, it's born, it's, you know, it develops, it grows, and then it falters and dies. No, economists don't want to have that happen, they want exponential growth. So I ban the term, and I ban the term degrowth as well, because it reinforces just by negating the concept, you reinforce the concept. For me, the really important thing is levels. What is the level of economic activity? What is the level of employment? Is it too high? Is it too low? The level of prices, inflation, too high or too low? At the moment, it's far too low. Uh, secondly, output. Are we churning out too much stuff to, within our ecological boundaries or have we churned out enough? So when you talk about levels, we're talking about what we manage in terms of the limits that we face, which are mainly ecological limits. So ban the term, we can't have growth, we can't have the concept of growth any longer. We only must think about how we build an ecological budget, a, a, a financial budget and an economic budget within our limited ecological budget. There's a wonderful physicist at uh, the Tyndall Center in Manchester who's given the mayor of Manchester, an ecological budget, and said this is as much dirty stuff that Manchester can emit. What are you now going to do to bring that down and manage it to ensure that life on Earth and life in Manchester continues? So we have to understand we've got two, two budgets and we have to live within them. So I'm on the question of free trade, this comes back to my point that I've made earlier, and I think this person is absolutely right to say that the Senate the Committee for Climate Change is not fit for purpose. I don't want us to use the word climate change. You know, it's a sort of nice sounding term. You know, it's getting warmer. We have to talk about climate breakdown, but even worse, we have to talk about Earth systems breakdown. 
the systems that provide life support for you and me, right? Those insects, biomass, insect biomass is collapsing. Those bees, first of all, pollinate the, the grains, the foods that we eat. Secondly, they clear up our mess, right? Insects are the creatures that, you know, recycle and deal with, put it plainly, shit, okay? Uh, cow pets. Where do you think cow pets go? You know, do they just evaporate and drift into the sky? No. They're broken down by insects. It, now what's happening is our insect population is collapsing. So we're not facing here climate change. We're facing climate breakdown and earth systems breakdown. And part of the problem is our commitment to not just the free movement of money across the world, depending where the hell it wants to go, but also free trade. That it should be unlimited, it should go on forever. And before you came in, I said, for example, we're going to have to grow our own green beans. We're going to have to localize our economy in the way in which Southampton is talking about it. We're going to have to not have a globalized economy. And finally, on the question, um, yeah, I think that's really the important point, is that we're going to have to limit all those things and live within our limits and be more sustainable um, in, in our consumption, above all. And to do that, we have to do something about growth. Thank you very much. Um, just to pick up on the growth question as well, and particularly the last point, um, which is how do you sort of sell changing that mindset to people? Um, and I think <laughs> what we're learning in our sort of community organizing is that people are really ready for that change. They recognize that the metrics aren't working. So there's you know the famous story um, of a King's College London professor in Newcastle. Um, who invited the audience to imagine a plunge in the UK's GDP and one particularly uh, emotive uh, audience member stood up and yelled, that's your bloody GDP, not ours. And so people recognize that the metrics that we use to assess how well we are doing as a society and as an economy um, are no longer fit for purpose. And so I think we don't really need to worry, to speak to her point, about selling that to people. Um, we need to, like Anne said, um, reconceive of, of what uh, we prioritize as economic metrics, so levels of employment and, and well-being, like for Johnny New Zealand, for example. Great, and get growth in well-being. I guess that's an area we do want growth in. Um, so in we have the specific questions now. Uh, something up there, well, Triodos Bank first. Should we go to you? Well, obviously, I'm delighted to be asked how do I open an account with Triodos. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, didn't plant the question, but I will, you know, thank you later. I, I, I can talk to you later about that. I, I, if, if I may, I just want to make a generic point off the back of it, which is that there is something in this country called the Current Account Switching Service, which allows people to switch within seven days. It is fantastic. It works very well. Um, the issue is we only have 900,000 people a year switching and there are only six banks, including us, that are seeing net growth in their overall number of customers that are, that are switching. So the, uh, the market has complete inertia and that's why I'd really like to see the sort of transparency that the UN principles I referenced earlier could bring about because if people really understood what their money was doing, I think you would get a very different reaction. But um, I'll, I'll very happily talk about your account later. So, and I, I'd like to just comment on the, the, the fair trade thing as well because... We, we're often referred to as the organic bank. We finance the Soil Association and 300 odd organic farms in this country. I am terrified about the idea of a trade deal with the US that has lower food standards, GM crops, and our, you know, our, our borders just opened up to what that really means. So. Well, so, so I, I do want to say something also on the sort of free trade uh, point because the, I think that the issue that you're raising um, effectively is that free trade is rarely free. Uh, and what we actually see often is wage dumping, for yeah. example. Yeah. You know, we see sort of human rights shifting. I mean, Newcastle, you know, the, the phrase um, that be like in taking, taking, sending coal to Newcastle was a proverb we grew up with because you know, Newcastle had so much coal, why would you ever send it out? We import coal from China and Russia in the course of time now. 
I mean, you know, where you have some of the high, as well as the environmental, we have some of the lowest standards of um, health and safety. You know, so, so what we need to do and what, you know, is to look at global supply chains and say, and this comes to a point I think Adri Adrienne touched on, what are the real costs here? Because actually what we're doing is we're, we're, we're accounting for some of the obvious costs, you know, what, 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 you know what, what it's been sold at, but all the other costs such as um, the environmental costs, the cost, the, the 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 cost to the to the environment, not only of the like growing the beef or whatever, but also of shipping it. All that needs to be properly accounted for, and that need, and when you look at that, when you when you put that as part of your trade agreements, then the sustainable advantages of of having local produce and good unionized working practices here, you know, become much more obvious. And I think you know. We have to do. We have to change how we how we account for things, so that fracking is no longer is not seen as economically viable because it's not paying the co the real costs which are associated with it. Um, and on you know on on sort of the GDP and the, and the committee for cl uh, climate change, we you know, th there are many <laughs> organ there are many measures. Actually, I spent a really depressing evening with the Royal Society looking at what it is that we measure when we talk about GDP and, wh and why we can't include uh, well-being in there. And so I was really pleased by what the Prime Minister for New Zealand did. You know, there, are, there are many bodies, organisations and measures which are not fit for purpose. Um, a Labour government will be making a difference with and without them. <laughs> So we're going to have one more round of questions, and I'm just going to have one from our invisible but present supporters from Positive Only First. This is from Julian Bournemouth. She says, I can currently invest in a green bond to fund investment in green technology by the German government, but not a UK government green bond to fund investment in green technology by the UK government to make our public sector more sustainable and in the long run save public money. What do you propose to do about that, or what are your thoughts? Uh, and I'll take two more. There's a hand here. Uh, there, with on the right. On the right. Yeah. And then we'll take this one here at the front. Hi, uh, David Hillman from the Robin Hood Tax Campaign. Simon. I just wanted to um, uh, ask you about the principles for responsible banking. I know that Triodos are one of the 30 uh, founder members. Um, but essentially, the banking sector are the greatest facilitators of the climate breakdown, the climate emergency because they're funding the exploration oh, sorry, and they're, they're funding the, the, the further drilling and, 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 and digging out. So they are facilitators of the carbon footprint that we have to bring down. So uh, I know there's the launch of the principles tomorrow, but organisations like BankTrack are extremely critical about that. Um, so I really would like to ask, you know, what they're saying is this does not go anywhere near far enough. So I really want to find out um, what your thoughts are on that and what Triodos as one of the founders could do about it. Great, and there's one more here with the, yep, I know who you are. So right, three points that I've kind of gathered from everything is, well, the first two is that first of all, the financial system needs to change, the banks need to change, but there's, I don't think there's been enough discussion around individual responsibility in terms because at the end of the day the financial system is driven by profit profit is seeked by individuals uh, individuals buy stuff to produce that profit uh, so at the end of the day what it kind of boils down to is how much palm oil is on that table over there how much soy are we eating you know how much all of this stuff that contributes to so much deforestation you know, I completely concur with all the regulation, the need for regulation, the need for a better system. But also I think it boils down to the fundamental question is how can labour afford a Green New Deal? And I think a massive part of that is down to individual responsibility. So for example, why can't there be things like, in, you go to a supermarket, big red letters, this product is sustainable, this product is not sustainable, etc. And um, I also concur with, you know, growing, growing your own beans, like the RSTB and stuff, for, exa for example, or saying, if you grow these plants in your garden, 
this is going to help the insect population, especially in rural communities. So that's, that's basically where I'm at. It's more of an opinion than a question, but um, thank you. Yeah, I felt like it needed to be said. Great. We um, thank you. Yeah. So we're rapidly running out of time, and I know Anne has to dash off to another event, which is very popular and doing lots across the conference. So if you want to pick up quickly um, on yeah. a couple of points. Yeah. So on green bonds, you know, I quite agree with your correspondent, or your member here that's asked Julia. and said we should have more green bonds. We're already working, and we're advising John McDonald, who's part of the uh, working group, on the fact that the Bank of England provides QE, which is a form of liquidity, to organisations who swap it for collateral, basically, and assets. And we're saying that unless that collateral, that bond, is a, a green bond and not a brown bond, the Bank of England shouldn't play ball, right? So we can change the system, we can make the sort of changes that we need by leveraging the power of the, the Bank of England, which is our bank. By the way, it's a nationalised bank, the Labour government nationalised it in 1945 because it had messed up in the 1930s, right? So it is a public bank. So what, that's one of the things that we could do. What was the other question? I think uh, if you don't have to pick up on them if you don't want to. Yes, individual I want to pick up on your yeah. point about individual your change and individual behaviour. You know, the Green Movement has been promoting individual behaviour change for a very long time and has got us nowhere, basically. You know, don't use plastic this, don't do that. It's not enough. We need to provide society with a structural framework within which people can act. So, for example, if I want to recycle, I live in the middle of London, I can't recycle very easily because my council doesn't provide me with the infrastructure that enables me to do that. So this happens also in a broader perspective. So I, I agree with you, we have to uh, tackle the whole question of individual wants and individual greed often and the demand for profits, but we actually have to provide a structural framework in which people can behave differently. And they do behave differently when you change the framework. So I'm sorry, I have to go. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us, Anne. And I'm going to pass over to Bevis to answer the second question. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, the, the, the UN principles are a great foundation. So the banks that sign up those um, firstly need to be held to account that they follow them through. But if you've got them having to publish the loans that they make, they have to consult their stakeholders, their customers on how they're, they're using their money, they are the, found, the right foundations for change. But at the minute, today, we're going to have 130 out of 25,000 banks globally sign up uh, on day one. So we need to hold those that do to account and we need more to sign up. Now that said, when they sign up to all of those, we also need to do more um, to drive change through those principles. And the point I was going to make and ran out of time on actually when I was talking was around the role of central banks. So one of the things that I would like to see is um, banks, are, banks' profits are driven by how much capital they have to hold. That the money that is theirs that is at risk in the event of uh, loans failing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, that is then driven by a sort of formula that has things called risk-weighted uh, calculations. So how much would you have to hold against that particular type of loan? So to bring that to life, we're a very large lender to social housing in this country. It's seen as a very sort of low-risk sector for banks because it's always going to be a societal need. Uh, if it, a housing association ever failed, you could apply to sell the property on the open market, et cetera, et cetera. So um, basically, you can hold 35% of the capital that you would hold against a normal, just everyday business loan. 35% makes it a lot more profitable for bank. It means you can drive down lower interest rates uh, for those type of projects. Um, so I would like to see uh, the Bank of England thinking about how they apply risk-weighted assets, not just to the balance sheet risk of the bank, but to the societal risks that that lending is creating in the longer term. That ultimately does come back to those banks. They're not disconnected from the environment or societal links. So the EU have indicated that they're going to apply 75%, 0.75 risk weightings to renewable energy, which is okay, but, uh, and I have a vested interest, I think it'd be great because we have a very large portfolio where renewable energy becomes instantly more profitable overnight, allows us to do more, invest in more, really for the scale of the challenge we face, 
we need to put a higher risk weighting on brown assets and fossil fuel industries and high polluting industries so they automatically become less profitable overnight and banks move away from them very fast. So that's just an example, but I, I do think the UN principles are fantastic and they are the platform to then engineer uh, a change in banking that we want to see. And that's one example of how I think we've got to then address the central bank's role in regulation. Very good. Thank, yeah, thanks so much, Lewis. Um, I'll move to Adrian if you want to pick up on any points. No, you're good? Okay, well, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and just not be a chair for a minute because Positive Money's done a lot of work on this as well. Uh, and actually had a meeting with the Bank of England the other day and they said they're going to start looking into this. As um, Lewis alluded to, it's much harder to get central banks to say they're going to have what we're calling like a brown penalising factor. So you have to hold more capital if you're going to lend to fossil fuels than a green supporting factor, which essentially tries to allow banks to lend more. Um, and I'm just going to plug our, our report uh, we did a couple of years ago on Green Bank of England, which is a, essentially about hard wiring sustainability into the central bank. We see it as the most powerful economic institution we have, and it's in public ownership, as Anne talked about. We can use it to help us drive the green transition. So just as um, we talked about risk weighting, there's a lot of other tools we could be using. Green bonds we mentioned, also just straightforward green QE, where when the central bank creates money that goes directly into potentially government funded projects. Also credit guidance, which is the idea where um, the Bank of England kind of says to the banking sector where it wants to guide credit into the economy. We see 80% of new lending from commercial banks uh, going straight into what we call the fire sector, finance, insurance and real estate. And that is very damaging for destabilising the economy. And as I said, we might be heading for another crash. So there's a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of different people doing different parts of it. Um, and the last point I just wanted to, to draw on is also the importance of a diverse, diverse banking sector in the UK. We currently have four big banks that mo monopolise the market and basically are going to be the hardest to shift. We talked a bit about Barclays and HSBC earlier. And I think what we need to replace that with is a, a kind of diverse set system uh, of ownership. So we can also have public banks and national investment banks, but also thinking about more smaller scale banks, but as I talked about retail banks, um, and how we also get them to have a purpose in terms of uh, sustainable transition, because it's certainly going to um, need all institutions and every institutions if we're going to do it over the next few years. Um, so I think I'll end, I think we're, we're going to finish two minutes early, guys, and I think there is some wine left, potentially Simon hasn't drank a little yet, no? Okay, great. Uh, maybe a tiny bit of food. I feel like this conversation has been fantastic to see not only how many people have turned up to show that we're passionate about green transition, we understand big finance is a barrier, but also an enabler of getting us to where we need to be. Um, and we've had a really wide range of discussions from uh, Committee on Climate Change and the problems with it all the way to trade deals to the Bank of England and more. So hopefully you've got something out of it and you'll stay in touch with both Foster Money and Triodos Bank. Looks like you've already got one new customer today, Chris. Just want to thank you all for coming and thank our panellists. A lot of them have obviously gone, but they were great. So if we give ourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.